Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burdens down. I'll go home to meet my Savior when I lay my burdens down. I'll go home to meet my Savior. When I lay my burdens down Glory, glory, hallelujah When I lay my burdens down Glory, glory, hallelujah When I lay my burdens down I will give my heart to Jesus When I lay my burdens down I will give my heart to Jesus when I lay my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burdens down. I will tell him all my troubles when I lay my burdens down. I will tell him all my troubles when I lay my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay time. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burdens down. All right. These are the days of the life. Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses Righteousness being restored And these are the days of great trials Of famine and darkness and sorrow And we are the voice in the desert crying prepare Riding on a cloud, shining like the sun, and a trumpet calls, let your voice, you jubilee, out of Zion's hill of salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones become coming as flesh, and these are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise, and these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world, and we are the laborers in this vineyard declaring the word of the Lord. Riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call of your voice, year of jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah, 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 there's no God there's no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, you're a jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation. 
ask if you will open up your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 8. The Gospel of Luke in the 8th chapter. You know, Jesus Christ, in the course of his ministry, he covered a lot in the two years that he traveled about. And, um, you know, it, it, just like anybody else, he stayed where he was welcomed. Well, you remember last week we talked about his visit to uh, Gadara, where there he delivered what they commonly call the maniac of Gadara, a fellow that was demon-possessed, had a whole legion of demons within him. Christ healed him, and the people were so shook up, so afraid, that they actually asked him to skedaddle. You know, they just said, uh, Guy, can you, 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 first of all, we just lost over 2,000 hogs. You just devastated our economy. You know, could you just, like, go away? We, we don't know about you, but we, we're not, we don't even feel safe with you around. And they sent him off, and he went. And yet, there are other places where we're going to, like, the place we're going to read today uh, a lot of people, because of Matthew and what Matthew says, that they think he's actually going back to Capernaum. But he is crossing the Sea of Galilee, and he's going into a city where he's going to be immensely welcome. Where, in fact, people were eagerly awaiting and anticipating his arrival. They had been, you know, like, oh, when is he going to come back? When is he going to come back? And he's back, and they're all excited about it. And you know what? I, when I look around the world today, I, I see that same kind of a thing, you know? Jesus Christ, he will go and he will stay and he will manifest himself where he is welcome. And there is nations where even though there are political structures in those nations that seek to the oppression of Christians, Christianity as an institution, because there are hungry, open-hearted believers in some of these places like Iran, Indonesia. Jesus Christ is showing himself in power there. And you come to a place like America, where it seems like the body politic in general, I know not in total, but you know in general, if you look out on the society and the way the society is tending, there's a, a weariness and a turning away from Jesus and a turning to other things. The exact opposite dynamic is taking place here. But you can go to any nation, you can go to any church, any local assembly, and I want to promise you this on principle, that where there are people that are pleased to abide in Christ, when they're excited for him to be there, when they want him to be there, when they have been waiting for him, eagerly anticipating when he would come, he does come, always, and he makes his presence felt. Boy, that's a good prayer for us, right here. And I want to go ahead and read the last part of Luke chapter 8. We're going to finish the 8th chapter here uh, today. We're going to begin reading at verse number 40. It says, And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. Now, for a ruler in the synagogue, one of those kind of like doctors of the law that had an authority and a teaching position in that high place, for him to actually fall down in his face, almost doing obeisance before the Lord, that was something. This is a man that apparently from what he had seen of Christ before and heard had a, a, a belief and a faith in his heart. And he was all excited in particular. He had his own reasons for being grateful that Jesus at, of at all times had appeared in their city. And he's coming with an eagerness to get him because he needs him. It says in verse 42, for he had one only daughter. About 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people, they thronged him. And a woman, having an issue of blood for 12 years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians, and neither could be healed by any, she came behind him and touched the border of his garment and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, who touched me? And when all denied, Peter 
And they that were with him said, well, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee. And thou sayest, who touched me? It's almost like they were saying, uh, Jesus, I mean, you know, everybody is surrounding you round about. Are you so surprised that you got touched? But they didn't realize what Jesus did. Okay, so he speaks out again. Jesus said, now somebody has touched me because I perceive that virtue has, or, or power, virtue or power, his goodness had been triggered, a release of divine healing energy flowed forth from his person. He was conscious of it. He felt the discharge in his body. So he knew he'd been touched. And he knew he'd been touched in a faith context. And so he says, who, who did it? And in verse 47, when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all of the people, for what cause? She had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has saved thee, made thee whole. Go in peace. You, you, you might see some parallels here. He just called this woman daughter. Who was Jarius worried about? A daughter. That daughter was 12 years old. This woman had had an issue of blood for 12 years. There's miracles being sought by people that have exhausted all human remedy. Let's continue to read this, and we're going to bring them both together with a certain theme here this morning that I think will be helpful to our church. He says in verse 49, While he yet spoke... There, there, there came one from the ruler, from Jairus' synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept, and they bewailed her. But Jesus said, Weep not, weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, and he took her by the hand. And he called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her some food, some meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Now, there was something that I wanted you to take note of in the very first verse that we read. He's just come back over from the sea of Galilee. He'd left from the southeastern quadrant, which is Gadara. He went and traveled north to the upper slopes of it. And it says in verse number 40, look at it. It came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people, they welcomed him, right? They gladly received him. For, and notice this, it says, they were all waiting for him. You know, I, that reminds me of another verse that's in John's gospel where a bunch of people came up to Jesus and they said to his disciples, says, Jesus, Lord, you know, all men seek for thee. To me, now these people, it says they were all waiting, all of them without exception. The people were all waiting. They weren't all waiting for the same reason. I understand that, you know, there are people that their, their motives may be mixed, may be a little disqualified. Even Herod the king, you know, had been waiting to see him, the Bible says, because he'd hoped to see some miracle done by him. Well, that kind of a waiting, you know, that's, that's a perfluous waiting. But there was a lot of people, they were waiting on God. 
They were waiting because of a need in their heart. They were waiting because Jesus represented something to their life that they couldn't lay hands on by any other means. They were waiting for a savior. They were waiting for one with, ha- with power to make a difference. And you know what? That Doesn't that describe you and I all the time? Let me tell you something. There are things in my life that I am waiting on God about. And if you're anything at all like me, and I don't even have to know all the particulars and the contours of your life, I know this much. I know that you are a human being in a fallen world, and I know that you have needs. And I know that you have, because you've been reading his word, there have been expectations raised in your heart. You have hopes, some of which have not been fully as fulfilled as what your heart longs for and so you wait on him yes you do and and just like the verse says here we all wait for him now what is interesting they were all waiting but then right after he goes and he gives a couple of examples and I just want to kind of like look at these uh, two examples here that begin with where it shows a little bit about the people that are waiting first of all let's consider the case of the woman it's one of two particular cases that are set forth. So we can say about this woman, that she suffered a very long and a tedious wait. I mean, if we were to kind of characterize the nature of the waiting that she was involved in, we could say that it was sort of a marathon wait. It was a long thing that went place over time. And she must have felt this very deeply. If you look there at verse number 43, We'll just read verses 43 and 44, if you will. It says, um, it says, And a woman, having an issue of blood for 12 years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians, neither could be healed by any of them. It was all in vain. She came behind him. And touched the border of his garment. We reached out and touched the the edge of it. And immediately her issue of blood was staunched. Um, She had an issue of blood. There are different words actually used. The one that Matthew uses is is the word from which we get our word, our English word, hemorrhage. But just to make it short, it's, it's commonly agreed that she had a uterine hemorrhage. In other words, the woman, she had a female problem. And it had been going on now for 12 years. It wouldn't stop. And uh, it had, well, her health, you know, a thing like that. When you lose blood, you realize the loss of blood, it weakens the body. It really does. The the life of the flesh is in the blood. And when all of a sudden there is a a, a hemorrhage that just keeps going, it it begins to degrade the power and the ability of the body. But, you know, after 12 years of waiting, I think it it would have to be a, a tremendous drain upon the spirit of the woman as well. I mean, yes, it's hitting her physically, but it's it's hitting her spiritually. Don't you think that over the course of this now 12 years, she had cried out to the God. She had been waiting now a long time and looking for him. And it also had destroyed her financially in the sense that she had spent what means she had on physicians. And, well, they did what they could, but they really couldn't affect a cure. She was at a place right now. She had proven through experience that... um, she had a problem that was beyond the skill and ability of mortal men to handle. And there are such problems. There are things that I'm glad we live in the day we live in. And we have some pretty smart doctors. And we do well to avail ourselves of them. And when myself or any of my family members get sick or something, I, we take them to the doctors. And we're glad for the care we can get there. But you know what? There comes a point in time when all of a sudden uh, the wisdom of man falls short. There's, there's, we run into situations where men can't do anything about it. And in her day, she was in the middle of such a situation, and she knew it. It says that she, all the, the, the doctors took her money. They didn't give her any help. Matter of fact, she began to grow worse. It was getting worse as time went by. 
Well, that forecasted death for the woman, actually. And to give you some sense of it, I'm just going to quickly ask you to turn to Leviticus, if you will. Keep your ribbon in Luke 8, but turn to Leviticus chapter 15, if you will, please. Um, let me just read some of the law, because I want you to understand the full ramifications of what was going on in this woman's life and what she had to suffer through and why it was such a long, tedious marathon of a wait that she had. In Luke, Leviticus chapter 15, if you'll look at verse number 19, he's giving instructions here. Moses is, he says, And if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even, and everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean, and everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean, and whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be unclean until the evening. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And uh, if... Any man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon her, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean, etc. But notice in particular, verse 25 is what I wanted you to see. Verse 25 is the summation that really nails down what this woman was going through, because it says there, it says, And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation. In other words, exactly what this woman was experienced. It, it was chronic and continual, and it would not go away. Or if it run beyond the time of her separation, then all of the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. In other words, you understand how this impacted the life of this poor woman? She couldn't go to the temple to worship. If there was a marriage, you know, she couldn't really go uh, to the, the wedding reception. This was in a day they didn't really have all the modern hygienic helps that we happen to have right now. And as far as what the Mosaic law had set forth, she was considered to be ceremonially unclean. And so this really had messed everything up for her so that even there was even a problem. I don't know if she had kids or anything, but it would have been hard for her even to hug them. This is rough. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you've ever waited on God for anything for 12 years. I can say that I, I know I have. There have been things that I've been waiting on God for a long, long time. But uh, this right here is a great example of someone that's waited on God a long time for a specific thing. Now, I want you to also put in the way of contrast, let's look at J uh, Jarius, too. Um, and and his, his waiting wasn't for so long of a time. It wasn't like a long, protracted period of his life. But what it was was a sudden crisis kind of a thing in which everything became urgently pressing upon him all at once and uh, needed an attention. And, you know, that in itself, it requires a kind of a patience. And the ability, to, even though it's waiting in the short run, it's still very difficult. And I think we can identify and get into his shoes, how he must have felt going through these events. Um, look at verses 41 and 42 there. It says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was the ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet. He's in an urgent state, right? And he besought him. He begged him. He implored him that he would come to his house, for he had one only daughter, about 12 years old, and she lay a-dying. Okay? So he, he knew, as the ruler of the synagogue, he knew all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have no doubt in my mind that as soon as he found out that his little girl, his precious little girl, the only one he had was in the condition that she was, 
He went seeking for him. He probably dispatched whom he could to try and find him. And what a, what a grievous thing it must have been to him to learn that Jesus Christ, had, he'd taken off. Him and his disciples, they left. They weren't around anymore. Um, you know, in circumstances like that, you know, when you're just waiting, and you know that there's a man that can help you, and you believe there's a man that can help you, and you're just waiting for that help to come your way it, it can it, every moment can almost seem like an eternity i know on friday i was sitting with uh derek and dave there at the hospital and we watched as this uh as this helicopter this life light came in over the toledo hospital there and just kind of landed on the roof and i was just thinking to myself you know somewhere out there on the streets there are family members that are driving the streets to get to the hospital the helicopter, no doubt, got off there ahead of him. But you know what? When you're driving along that way, every moment can seem like an eternity. And uh, notice also it says that the crowd was pressing upon him. And that made the passage slow. Because, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that he, he, he knew the urgency of the situation. He would have liked to have whisked Jesus Christ now that he finally had him. He wanted to get him home, and it all of a sudden his, his daughter's situation had been degrading. It was imperative that he get there soon, and he was aware of that. And yet they could, it's like getting stuck on the freeway where you can only go like, you know, you're stopping and you're starting, and it's bumper to bumper, and you can't make any progress. And you know how impatient you can be if you need to be somewhere in a hurry, and everything is jamming the way. And not only that, not only did the crowd press upon her, but the, all of a sudden there was this interruption. There was this interruption where this woman appears out of nowhere. Who knows where she came from? And, uh, you know, Jesus is trying to find out who's done it. And everybody around him, they're all denying it. And the apostles are questioning, well, Lord, how can we trace it out? And then finally the woman comes and she makes the broken confession, and all this stuff is going on. This is this interruption, and you can just imagine how Jarius must have been there, like, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. And just about that time, when they were about ready to resume their travel and try and make it to where the little girl was, here comes a messenger and says, "It's too late now. It's too late now. When well, she just died, it's we're past the point of no return." There's, don't trouble the master. Uh, death is the reality we got to face now. There's nothing he can do. You know, there was something he can do. You know, sometimes Jesus waits on purpose. You know, sometimes, actually, the next time he raises somebody from the dead, the next time he raises somebody from the dead, he's going to dawdle so long that when he finally shows up, the guy's been dead four days, okay? And he does it on purpose, knowing full well in advance that the, 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 what's happening is all going to pan out for the glory of God. And I believe it was even so in this case. But my goodness, how difficult it must have been for Jarius and for his, his wife in that situation to wait on the timing of God. Don't you ever sometimes think that God's timing could be a little bit better if it followed our expectations? Haven't you ever been? I've been in this situation where I must have been just as antsy as, little, as Jarius were. And, you know, both of these kinds of things are, 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 are true. Sometimes we wait for a long, hard season like this woman did. Other times, it's just like an event, but it's hard to get through it. But the thing of the fact of the matter is, we all do wait on God. And I want to give you a, a, a word of encouragement here. Let me just say this. Nobody has ever waited on God in vain. That is impossible, people. It is impossible for you to wait on God in vain. If you are waiting for him because you have an expectation of good, that you know that he is good enough and powerful enough to meet that expectation, if there is not a thing wrong with it and your heart tells you that it's well within his word and you wait for that, you know what? There will come a day when your waiting will make a difference. Now, it may take a while, but no one ever... He said to the Israel one time, he said, I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. He says, I don't tell people to wait for me, to seek me to look to me for solutions, and it's all in vain. I'm the God who answers prayer. I'm the God who meets every need, but I do it in my timing. 
And my timing may not be exactly identical to yours, but he knows. You know, sometimes it is true that there are certain things in life that we don't actually, there, there are things that we may carry to our grave. The um, Bible says Abraham looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker was God. That was, in other words, there was a deep burning and abiding desire in Abram's heart to see the city of God, the capital city of the great king and kingdom, that he knew that there was a kingdom being promised. He knew that God would send his son. I don't know how much of, you know, we know a lot more doctrinally speaking than what he did, but he was looking for new Jerusalem is what he was looking for, and he never saw it in the course of his earthly lifetime. But there were things that he just had to wait a long time for. You remember when God told him he would give him a seed? Right? Do you know he was 100 years old when Isaac, the promised seed, was born? That's a long wait. And as far as he was concerned, when Isaac was born, everything had become impossible. It was, you know, Sarah was 90. I'm 100. Are you kidding? A kid now? (laughs) You know, that's not quite possible. And yet it happened. God delights in impossibilities. But why does God sometimes keep us waiting? You know, there's some things that are kind of suggested in this little passage. As we look at these two cases, and it's a miracle inside of a miracle. We, at the very beginning, it says, they're all waiting. And then it zeroes in on these two, uh, these two case situations where people were waiting. And I, I, there's some common features here that I think we can learn some things. Number one... Let me just say this. Why does the Lord keep us waiting? Sometimes he may be waiting for our circumstances to reach to the point of maximum impossibility. In other words, part and parcel of his waiting, it allowed circumstances to develop to the point in both of these cases where, where people just ha- had a, an idea in their mind that it was like nothing could be done. In the case of this woman, let's just imagine this. Let's suppose that the woman had only, instead of having been afflicted for 12 years, let's suppose it had only been a couple of months. Let's suppose that she'd had this situation a couple of months And let's suppose further that maybe she saw one or two doctors and tried a couple of things. No, it didn't pan out. But then, whew, wow, Jesus shows up. Well, she's been in in this discomfort for, for two months now, but then she's healed. What kind of an impact would that have made on her as compared with the impact that made when all of a sudden she had long labored under a sense of something that was absolutely devastating, that was ruining her life, and that it was utterly impossible for men to ever overcome it. And then suddenly to be given that perfect freedom. And notice that in her case, Jesus didn't reach out and touch her. He may, he may have been conscious of the fact that she was in the crowd and behind her. The Bible doesn't get too specific. But it does say that she had faith in her heart, that she believed that if she but touched him, if she but touched him, that would release power. And she did. And she reached out there and she touched the hem of his garment. And kaboom, she felt it. It was like not only did he feel it leaving him, she felt felt it entering her, and she had this conscious knowledge. She knew within herself that she had been healed. She could no longer doubt it. You know, some people might, they might want to fault the Lord Jesus Christ, and they'd say, well, that was kind of a cruel and insensitive thing. If God has all power, why would he allow that woman to suffer like that for all those years? Maybe he could have showed up a long time earlier. Maybe he could have done something. But you know what Jesus Christ did for that woman? The very best thing he could do. Because in the aftermath, what do we find? That her heart, because she didn't have any complaints, by the way. When you read stories like Job, you know, when, when Job is sorely tried. At the end of the book, Job is not complaining and condemning God. Job is in an awe of God. And I believe that this woman... Two, I believe her heart was forever captured 
to the Lord. I don't believe that she could ever after this doubt the goodness of God. And, and really, the fact that he didn't even utter a word. When Jesus Christ speaks and heals somebody, we can attribute that to his divine authority. But when he hasn't spoken, and there's a person behind him, and that person says, I know it's in him because of who he is to heal me. And they reach out in secret and they touch. And there is, he says, virtue is gone out of me. The power of my goodness, my moral purity, that power has been released. You know, that, that's a tribute to the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let's also consider what had happened then if Jairus, if Jesus Christ had arrived to the, see the daughter, well, you know, before she died. Let's just for a moment uh, consider that he got there and, you know, she was like in a swoon and going down and people were worried. He goes in there and he shuts the door. And after a little while, she comes out. She's not raised from the dead, but she seems to be doing better. So in other words, she's resuscitated. You know, that, that, that wasn't what Jesus Christ wanted to do. It is within the power of men to resuscitate sick people. We can do that. We can, we can help people that are sick. As a matter of fact, we do it all the time. We have doctors. Luke, who's writing this account, was a physician. He knows well that there is power God-given but within men so that we can help sick people get better. But to all of a sudden raise the dead... Did you notice what happened as soon as they came and they told uh, uh, Jerry, he says, your daughter's dead. The assumption upon that word, your daughter is dead, was don't even bother to trouble him. There's nothing. She's past the point now. We're talking about death here. This isn't healing. This is something that can't be done. This, uh, what, what she's, you know, because it's beyond the range of human possibility to go to a dead person and tell him to get up. And I believe that's what Jesus Christ was waiting for. He was waiting for the impossible. He was waiting for the impossible. And he goes in there and he says, little maiden, get up. And that's encouraging to me because I don't know what you're waiting for. I know, what, I know a lot of the things that the Lord has given me as a heart desire. And he's allowed me to wait these many years. And I can also testify this, that in faithfulness, there have been things I've waited for a good long time. You know, I waited for a wife for a long time. I didn't get married till I was 38 years old. And I can testify that, you know what, after that long wait, I was given the best of the best of the best, you know. God does visit people, and, and we never do wait for him in vain. Turn, if you will, please, to Isaiah chapter 30. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 30. And I will read in verse number 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment and blessed are all they that wait for him. You know, there is one other thing that I might mention about this waiting as a, a possible reason why sometimes we're kept waiting. And I think that we shows up pretty clearly in both of these cases. A frequent purpose for waiting, making us wait is to test or to train our faith uh, in, in the Lord. Um, you know, when, when the Lord does keep us waiting, some people might say, well, he's doing it because of his glory. He's going to do something that is uh, to his glory. And I, and I believe that's a part of it, but I don't believe that's the whole thing. I think a lot of times the Lord keeps us waiting because, again, what he wants to do ultimately is he wants to bind the hearts of people to himself. And he realizes, he knows of a certainty 
that when he finally does come and he blesses people with blessings that uh, they could not have otherwise expected, that that capturing of their heart is the best thing that could have ever happened to them. It's better than the mere blessing itself. What we really, really need is not just the healing or the gift of money or the answer to a conundrum, the things that are an immediate source of our perplexity. Those things can be given. Those things are given. But at the end of the day, the thing that we need more than anything else, and sometimes we're kind of slow to realize it, to get it, is him, to be attached to him, to be living in a dependent relationship upon him. And sometimes the whole business of the long wait or the tedious wait is so that when he deals with us in that particular situation, yeah, all of a sudden our faith attachment to him is strengthened. I don't believe that Jarius, his wife, or this unnamed woman ever lost faith in the Lord again. I think their faith in him and their desire and commitment to Jesus was rock solid. Let's just, we're running out of time, but let's look at one more verse, if we will, please. Maybe two, but at least one. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold testings, trials, temptations, right? Why? That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, that that, that, that that trial of your faith, that purification of your faith, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, we have to leave it up to the divine wisdom as to whether or not there is a needs be in our life to be in, left in a place of waiting for him for some reason. Maybe it is the development of our faith, or maybe it may even be the testing of our faith. You know, he does do that. He tests our faith as well. And sometimes the, 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 the weight that we may be involved in is a kind of a test upon our faith. Why don't you turn back to Luke, but only go to Luke chapter 5. I'll show you one more verse here. It's related to the same thing. Luke chapter 5, if you will, please. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 5. Um, actually, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 4. Uh, he's been preaching to the crowds from out of Peter's boat. And then uh, when the crowds are kind of done and dispersed, now, you know, the sun's going overhead. We're getting later in the day here. And Jesus speaks to Peter. It says, when he left off speaking to the crowd, he says unto Simon, Hey, launch out your boat into the deep and let down your, your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Well, if he's just toiled, if he's worked hard all night and it's now, you know, mid-morning, you know what Peter is? He's tired. He wants to go home. He wants to go to bed. And he's a commercial fisherman, and he knows perfectly well this is not the time to catch fish. The sun is up high. Things are getting warm. Nobody catches fish at this time of day. You know, Lord, why don't you, you know, preach spiritual truth and let me figure out when's the best time to fish? Because you don't catch fish today. Not at this time, right? But is that what Peter says? You know, he might have thought some of those thoughts maybe, but that's not what he says. Look at out of respect for Christ's mere word what he says. Um, Lord, we've toiled all night long. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. I'll give it a try out of respect for you. You said so? All right. Let's, let's try it. Who knows? Maybe the impossible will happen. You know what the impossible actually happened in that case? Sometimes we just have to be willing when a situation presents itself, to avail ourselves by faith, 
to a hope and to claim promises. And maybe, maybe there's a part of our mind that says, oh, demographics are all against, you know, a great mighty thing happening here or someplace else. There's always something that, you know, humanly speaking, might seem to be a stymie, a stumbling block before the Lord to having all of our desires realized. The Lord says, well, you just, you just you call on me and ask me. And you know what I'll do? The day will come when I choose it to come that I'm going to show you great and mighty things that you've not seen yet, but I have in store for those that wait for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, here we have seen this morning, Lord, two people that, Lord, uh, they had very specific needs. We're not surprised by that, Lord. We realize that the circumstances of all of our lives, particularly, Lord, the lives of those who belong to you, they're very carefully ordained of you, Lord. You created the needs. You allowed them to come to the place of need. And, Lord, in the end, Lord, we see what blessing was wrought in their lives when they turn to you lord in both cases there was a kind of a weight an exercise of their faith that had to take place but we are so very very grateful lord that you do hear us you you meet with us lord um just want to pray that you would meet all the needs that are assembled here lord i don't even know what they all are but i know that they are And the best thing is, Lord, I know that you know exactly what they are. So I would just ask, Father, that every soul here that has sat patiently, Lord, to listen and to reflect upon the truths in your word, Lord, that you would give them something from that word, Lord, that would be an enriching of their own heart life. We want to ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.